So, Robin Price is a PhD candidate in the Kotzen Institute of Archaeology at the University of California, Los Angeles. She has participated in archaeological excavations in many countries, including Cyprus, Israel, Spain, Egypt, Ethiopia, and in the US. Her interests include understanding how sensory experience, particularly that of smell, functions as an organizing factor in society. And with her research, she seeks to humanize the past, working to make it more accessible and relevant to modern peoples. She has a master's degree from the University of Virginia and the University of Memphis in linguistic anthropology and Egyptian art and archaeology, respectively. Welcome, Robin. Thanks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Thank you very much, Clara, for the uh, introduction and for um, Saskia and Mineta also getting me involved in this and allowing me to present some more of my research. Um, like Clara was saying, my name is Robin. I'm at the Coatesan Institute at UCLA here in Los Angeles. And I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so talking to you about a little bit of my research and some of the new stuff that I've been working on lately. Specifically, my research examines the manipulation of scent and its role in the construction of ancient Egyptian society. Uh, it largely deals with the New Kingdom, so we're talking about 1550 to 1070 BCE. And this is kind of the period that is most well known by uh, the general public because it includes King Tut, Ramses the Great, Hatshepsut, and all of these big name peoples that you might be familiar with. But I try to draw some examples from other periods in order to get a big picture perspective on how the conception of scent and its use in the construction of society changed through time. For example, we could even reach out all the way back to the pre-dynastic period in which there are figurines that tend to exaggerate the nose and the chin area up here, um, which Egyptologists tend to analyze as an early reference to the breath of life, which we're gonna spend some time talking about today. Ultimately, I see the ancient Egyptian conception of smell centering around the fact that scent, like breath, is invisible, yet can be felt by the peoples of the earth. So should scent prove to be in the invisible marker, in fact, of divine presence in some situations, so too might breath be the invisible yet felt force of life. In fact, gods give you the breath that you breathe, according to the ancient Egyptians, and that this physical representation of life, namely the taking in and out of breath into your body, is an act that can be seen visually, um, but the air that you're breathing and that is actually providing that life force can only be experienced. But how you might ask, would we go about studying this for a society that's been dead for thousands of years? Objects which are familiar to us tempt us to study them in similar ways that we would understand them today. But in reality, value and meaning is culturally constructed, like this quote, uh, one of my favorite quotes I put up on the screen here for you. When I began studying scent, I immersed myself in this history to identify the Egyptian understanding of this bodily experience, namely scent, before making assumptions as to its value for these distant people. And what I'm interested in exploring in today's talk specifically is this nuanced distinction in the ancient Egyptian conception of perception, specifically for scent, to expose our modern biases on the subject. So I'm going to go into a little bit of how our current understanding of scent has really influenced our understanding of the ancient Egyptian uh, conception of scent with a little bit about what it, uh, the differences that might have actually been going on. So we're gonna do this first by speaking about how English has been influenced by its earlier uh, contexts in sp uh, talking about specifically how our bodies are related to the world. And this takes us to 17th century, the enlightenment, at which point I feel like our problem really cemented, um, at which point Kant and Descartes, Descartes, people who are probably familiar to many people in this audience, were fighting over whether or not the senses for Kant or reason for Descartes was the best way of understanding or being able to identify what reality really was. Kant coined this phrase transcendental idealism, which argued that our perception of the world is actually more trustworthy than our logic for the simple fact that it's really the only way that our body can be in the world. And this was contrary to Descartes' argument that said the senses were unreliable so we can only 
perceive the outside world through reason and logic. This ultimately led to the development of a series of good-bad dichotomies, such as the mind-body, reason our emotion, and we're going to see how these dichotomies actually affect our ability to understand other cultures. In actuality, both Descartes and Kant seem to have been right to an extent, according to our modern theories. The interface theory of perception, as well as a complicated sect of physics that's well beyond my pay grade and mental capacity, suggests it's true that we can't use our senses to perceive reality in its truest form. But our senses are, in fact, the only way that we can engage with the world, and that they're actually intentionally evolved in order to be misleading. The goal of perception is not to view the world as it really is, but in such a way that helps us to survive. We can liken this to a computer screen with its icons to help us navigate, which help us navigate the digital world. These icons are not in fact true representations of the processes the computer is going through, but is perhaps the simplest and best method for us to achieve our goals. Despite these advances in our understanding of the body's function in the world, we see a lasting influence of Descartes' model and emphasis on reason over emotion in how we use the English language. So we can take a look at these hopefully familiar phrases on the screen. These metaphors, for lack of a better word, point to the extent to which our understanding of character traits are shaped by our understanding of sensory perception. A particular interest here is how sensory related words are used to convey elements of cognition. In the West, we, have hev we heavily rely on visual terms or words that with visual etymologies uh, to communicate cognition, such as point of view, overview, focus, speculate, and idea. Thought is thus being conceptualized in terms of sensory experience and is not distinct from it. As Constant Classen recently published, uh, she said, and the quote's on the screen for you, the exploration for how we grope to express sensory experience through language and to convey non-sensory experiences through sensory metaphors is revealing not only of how we process and organize sensory data, but also how the sensory, un how also of the sensory underpinnings of our culture, which I think is a nice reflection of what I'm trying to do with the ancient Egyptian material. And yet these nuances of language are often ignored when it comes to the study of ancient cultures. So just a few brief examples will show us what I'm trying to show you for the Egyptian context. What seems to be emphasized in these examples here on the screen is the physicality of experience rather than the emphasis on the cognitive. For example, if we just look at these few common phrases, we might start to get an idea of what's going on. Instead of using the word for not knowing something, like the Egyptians, which the Egyptians definitely had, the more common phrase that we find in the text is this idea of turning or not turning your head in order to pay attention or to ignore someone. Similarly, instead of phrases of praise and worship, the supplicant will additionally be described as smelling the earth. Note here that the word for smell and the word to kiss are the same word in the Egyptian, and that's a whole nother presentation. Uh, and we can see an image of this on this tomb scene on the screen. The description of the physical act of bowing seems to emphasize distance from an outside source, which is gonna be an important note for our later discussion. Another example is the literal coming of God being the phrasing for what we translate in English as epiphanies, which actually comes from the Greek word meaning to reveal, which has this visual bias we were talking about from before. We can see how this nuanced emphasis gets obscured by English translations of the ancient Egyptian texts, such as in this example listed at the bottom of your screen, where we see your sense is no longer with you, and actual, in a more literal translation is your heart is not in your body. So I'm hoping you're starting to pick up on this difference between more of a descriptive, almost cognitive translation of these phrases versus the physical fact that your heart is not in your body. In this other example, now at the bottom of your screen, we see uh, an ignorant man without sense being actually translated more literally as a man who knows not because my heart does not exist. So again, the same kind of thing going on. So what are the implications of this? 
The implications of this bias in our sources has led to translation errors, which give, excuse me, which give precedence to our cognitive models that value reason over emotion, over the specific cultural model, which does not seem to embody this mind-body dichotomy. Not to mention the ancient Egyptians believed the heart to be the center of the self rather than the mind, if that doesn't tell you something. Additionally, it obscures the concrete reality of sensory experience that is emphasized in the language of the ancient Egyptians, and so by extension, their beliefs in the organization of the society as a whole. For example, in this story of which a quote is here excerpted, a high priest is met with an unhappy ox spirit of a Middle Kingdom official whose tomb has decayed over the years. When Khonsuamheb, the priest, realizes how awful death truly is, the story reads, Khonsuamheb sat and wept beside him with a face full of tears. And he addressed the spirit saying, how miserable are these spirits without eating, without drinking, without age, without youth, without the sign of the sun's rays or the smell of the north wind. Darkness is in their eyes every day and they shall not rise in the morning to depart. Such description indicates that life is in fact the opposite of death, wherein all physical experience is lost. The body is built up here with touch, with smell, vision, movement, emotion, taste, and vigor. To understand this value placed on the body is to just begin to truly understand the ancient Egyptian way of being. In this way, life is marked by the experiences under which the body goes. We might compare our differing conceptions of death, where the Egyptians sought to preserve the body and to revivify it as a sensing being, whereas today many choose to discard the body, burning it, while some believing our minds or souls will outlive its fleshy cell. So finally, I'd like to look at how specific this concrete physicality of sensory experience played out when it comes specifically to scent. Like we saw before with the phrase to kiss or to smell the earth, scent was valued for the way it communicated distance, physical distance, whether it is leaning close to identify an illness, describing a longing to be near your lover, or describing your love of your native city. To smell something was to describe its closeness to you. And we'll go through just a few examples of these um, to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. So here, if we look at 18th dynasty, so early New Kingdom tomb scenes, a very clear distinction comes to, to mind. And that is between images that have scent and images that do not communicate scent. So here's an example of a coppersmith. And if anybody has ever been near a furnace, you know that coppersmithing does not smell very nice. And the ancient Egyptians were very aware of this and agreed that no, this smell is not something very pleasant. In fact, it stinks more than fish eggs. Uh, as this quote shows. But many scenes, in fact, do have lots of scented imagery, such as the ones shown here, which include incense, like we see here, if you can see my pointer, bouquets of flowers, unguent cones, uh, fillets around the head, lotus flowers hanging off the, the forehead, um, clothing soaked in scented oil, all kinds of scent being marked in these scenes. And if we compare the uh, ritual literature, contemporary ritual literature with these images, we come, might come to understand, in fact, that divine presence can be evoked through the inclusion of scented materials, sweet scented materials, um, thus ex ensuring the success of a ritual. Because if you're depicting the presence of the gods already in your ritual scenes, then of course the ritual must have been successful, right? But what also was going on is this building up of a scentscape or an atmosphere of scent, communicating this nearness of the divine to the deceased. And this is a, these arrows are meant to indicate just how much scent we get in these images. Thus, when we talk about purifying spaces and bodies, especially with regards to temple rituals, the ancient Egyptians believed anointing with oils, moisturizing with scented unguents, and the burning of incense was in fact the highest form of purity, in that it marked the presence of the divine. You were literally filling up the space with the God's presence. And because it is this invisible divine force, which provides uh, breath to the humans, and scent is the experiential marker of that being's presence, such images are designed to create and recreate life for eternity, such as illustrated with this example on the screen of the offering of the bouquet of Amun to provide breath to the deceased day by day. 
what we're seeing here actually even goes beyond just scent into the physical realities of our bodies, meaning the physical yet invisible manifestation of powerful forces that direct our life ways. For the ancient Egyptians, it was not vision that was primary or most valued, but the body as a whole built from its parts. And this part, scent, which we're discussing today, marks the distance from the body, whether it is a life-giving invisible force of your lover or the presence of the divine. Here are three examples of love poetry, also from the New Kingdom, which communicate this same idea. The, um, in the first example of the short love poem, the, art, the artist or the author, there we go, he describes the scent of his lover when, he reaches, uh, when she reaches out to him with her arms. Kunt here being the mythical God's land from which much of the prized scented material like myrrh is often referenced throughout Egyptian contexts. It is this physical reaching out of scent that he feels um, that in the way that he's able to feel her because he essentially can smell her because she's so close. In the second example, her body is likened to one drenched in scented oils, again equivocating this description of his love with a physical description of scent that emphasizes his closeness to her. Finally, in my favorite example, the lover indicates he would be satisfied just to be near enough to his lover's dirty garments so that he might wash out the ointment from them and wipe it on his own skin. Mm -hmm. Again, to suggest a reference to wanting simply to be near her as she is identified through her scent. It's a lovely image. We see this same idea also expressed in royal contexts, such as the divine birth scene of Hatshepsut, in which her mother is visited by the god Amun disguised as her husband. The woman, Akhmozi, recognizes the god by his scent and becomes drenched in his fragrance after his smell, wink, wink, fills the room. <laughs> in another example from the Karnak table, uh, temple at Thebes, there are lintels of a room built and then rebuilt by Hatshepsut and then Thutmose III, dedicated to the production of incense pellets for burning. We see here the desire to bring close the smell of God's land to this, the house of God, a seemingly necessary undertaking given the repetition of this phase, phrase throughout Egyptian history. Additionally, as, an, as a great example also of the dangers of letting our mod, modern biases affect our translations, and this poem that describes how much the author loves his home, the city of Thebes down here in the south. He writes how he prefers the animal products of his own city to the nicest anointing oils of distant lands. Note here in the translation where I've actually written that I love the oil of Thebes more than the ointment of another land is a false translation of this passage. And that it's actually, I would pref I pre basically prefer the smell of dirty animals to the best oils of foreign lands. This serves as yet another commentary on scent and distance, wherein the value of foreign scented products were recognized by people even outside the royal and highest elite spheres as a display of power over distant lands. Think of a comparison for those of us in LA where you see those expensive Teslas everywhere, or for those farther afield, just any kind of sports car. You know they exist, that they're expensive and are theoretically attainable, but for many of us, especially me, who's an archeologist, will likely never be able to buy one. We might read into this poem the greater effects of this recognition of value attributed foreign scented goods. It comes down to the idea that the secrets, that secrets give the keeper power, but only if you tell everyone you have a secret without revealing what that secret is. So it seems likely that the highest of the elite maintained their power in this way. Like we see in this example where the scribe prefers his own city to the nicest product he can think of to illustrate his point, namely that of a foreign scented oil demonstrates how intrinsic this cultural meme of scent to distance and now foreign scent as the best of these scents was known and recognized by the people of ancient Egypt. In our final example, we see the emphasis on scent and its relationship to the bringing near of divine presence and the preparations made for burial, both in the application of scented oils and resins to the corpse, the burial of scented products beneath the beds of the deceased, and the inclusion of cosmetic kits like the one we saw from the first slide among the burial equipment. This invisible presence was manipulated in a way to achieve a particular purpose, and while that purpose might have been multivalent at its most basic level, it provided a commentary on the nearness of external forces. Uh, I'm going to show an image of a skeleton, just so everyone's prepared. 
Perhaps during the Q&A, we can discuss this some more, but I see the case for the unguent cone, for those of you familiar with it, as a perfect illustration of what I'm talking about. It serves as a physical or visual manifestation of these invisible forces, which we've been discussing. Whereas it begins as an artistic tradition in two-dimensional art, it is adapted into the physical world through experimentation in this burial that we see on the screen. It is not necessarily important that the visual representation actually smells as the findings for the residue analysis on this cone indicates it may not have, because the power of scent is actually evoked through the form of the cone, which was established as scent carrying in two-dimensional art, which I think is really interesting. So sensory experience among the ancient Egyptians was a concrete way of describing their world. Thus the physicality of the senses seems to overturn our bias for the cognitive over the emotional. To truly understand the variety of ways for conceptualizing sensory experience across history, we have to first recognize our own implicit biases before and while undertaking such a journey into the past. For the ancient Egyptians, the world was experienced through their bodies, which included what we label separately as our minds. To smell was not just something that communicated a particular experience to our minds that we could choose to ignore, but was actually a physical assault on the body by external forces. It was and is, despite our dismissal, a physical engagement with the environment that alters our bodies in some form. This, I would argue, is how the ancient Egyptians experienced all life, more immediate and affective, rather than the cognitive models that we create to distance ourselves from our environments. Sensory experience today is distracting, so we seek to desensitize our spaces so that we can work and create and accomplish, rather than to experience, embody, and relate. Neither model might be judged to be superior, but it is important to recognize that both exist and that in fact, the ancient Egyptian manner of living, while quite similar to us in many ways, was foundationally different from those today. Um, so I just have a few acknowledgements for the creators of the conference, as well as my advisors and my fellow speakers and audience, of course. And if you are interested in contacting me or have any follow-up questions, I've put my website up here as well as, and I'm happy to respond to emails as well. So thank you so much for coming in today. Uh, Regina had a question, so I was going to make her live. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. Uh, that was super fascinating, Robin. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm really curious. I know, I know your focus is, is Egypt, but I'm, I'm really curious because Mesopotamia was operating almost nearly parallel to uh, Egyptian society. And I'm wondering if there was any crossover between the two cultures in regard to, to scent-based ideas. Yeah, so that's something that I'm really interested in, but it's something I think I have to pursue after I finish my dissertation. But one thing that I noticed is that, and that's always been really fascinating for me, is the fact that the Mediterranean world in this ancient period, namely the late Bronze Age, was really um, full of perfumes and they were all identified locally, right? So Cyprus had their own perfumes, Egypt had their own perfumes, Mesopotamia had their own perfumes. and um, each of the individual countries seem to value the ones that come in from the outside more than the ones that are produced locally. Wow. And then when we get to the later periods of the, the, Ptolemy, the Ptolemy, so when the Greeks come into Egypt and kind of take over, it, the Greek texts seem to value the Egyptian perfumes over all the other ones. So it's, it, at some point, the Egyptian perfume becomes the, the status quo, the one that everybody wants. And there's some interesting quotes from this period which talk about how um, it's not even like where the perfumes are originally made that's important, but it's the original, it's the people who are making them. So you might have Egyptians in the Levant, which is modern day Syria, Palestine, making um, perfumes that would still be valued higher than the ones made by, you know, non-Egyptian peoples. Wow, that's really fascinating. Thank you. I appreciate it. Of course. Um, I'm going to lump a couple questions together. So from Dorothy... Heather and uh, Therese, we have questions about um, if you could be more specific about the fragrance and scent materials that were used and particularly which of those scents were especially divine. So that's a, it's a good question. So something that I actually push back on in my research is the value of particular scents to the ancient Egyptians beyond more of this kind of good bad dichotomy, which I know kind of goes against a lot of what I was just saying, but it's interesting because we have all these, and this is something I'm working on now, but we have all these terms for specific types of oil, 
But when we try to compare them across contexts, across contemporary contexts, it seems like those same terms are kind of in interchangeable. So it doesn't necessarily seem like they were using, they were too concerned with specific, like the specific flour you're using or the specific oil you're using. It was more this, the end product that you were developing that had this kind of nice scent. Now we know for sure myrrh was a big thing coming from, from God's lands, uh, likely somewhere around Somalia or uh, Ethiopia today. Uh, that was definitely a major ingredient. Um, we also have a lot of residue analysis that has suggested pistachia resin, which comes from the Levant. So again, modern day Syria, Palestine, mostly Syria, Lebanon actually, um, comes from the ter a terebinth resin or mastic. It's all kind of the same thing. That was definitely popular. But we also know that they were using local products like Moringa oils and Lotus and papyrus and all of these kinds of things to make their perfumes. Um, the difficulty with identifying them in the ancient record is that the ancient Egyptians didn't write down any recipes. So we don't know specifics for that one as for one of those reasons. But also because when you get a jar of material and it's labeled bucket oil, the only way to really be able to identify what that is is to do residue analysis. But how many of you have used Tupperware to contain a million different things, right? So it's likely such jars were reused. So it's it's very problematic to identify specific scents, unfortunately. There's a lot of questions and this is a really deep topic. And unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. So okay. Robin, really, thank you so much for your for sharing your knowledge as always. And of course, thank you.